and I see that these, you know, you, you could, you, you can't have one without the other, because I'm actually just thinking, I'm reading this book about the, you know, the beginnings of the fall of the Roman empire. And they actually had a system in place, uh, partly that was like, you can only be the leader for one year. Uh, you, you know, your term in the, the Senate was, it was only, you know, presidency essentially was, was only a year. Um, but there was other parts of that system that encouraged the um, sort of the obedience and the discipline and the, uh, you know, pushing people with political ambition to the top. Yeah. So you, you need both the system and the sort of the individual to, to learn or, or either the, right. the young people learning sovereignty or the old people like deconditioning into sovereignty. Exactly. Let me just reflect something back, Derek, because you said you just read a book about the Roman Empire, right? Yes. So that means you were able to read this book to fully digest both the triumphs and the failures of the Roman Empire and learn from it, right? Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one big difference between the Roman Empire and now is that you've read that book, but they couldn't read that book because they were living it, right? <laughs> yeah. So we've got the benefit of learning from their mistakes. And not only from their mistakes, we've got the benefit of learning from every example of attempted hierarchy and power dominance that has ever happened. And hopefully we've got to the point now that we can not, that we can not just tweak these systems, but thoroughly recreate them. In other words, not just recreate hierarchy with a tweak, but actually abandon hierarchy and explore um, decentralized systems. You know, there's a quote that I really love. <clears throat> uh, I believe it's Einstein that says, you, you can't solve a problem at the same level of consciousness it was created. And <laughs> I've got to tell you a super funny story about that okay, quote. Okay, Keep yeah. going. Well, I was just going to say, like, that's exactly, you know, recreating a different hierarchical system is just the same level. Yeah. You know, yeah. Of... Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'd love, would love your story. Oh, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's a red herring. It's, it's a non circular. It's just a funny story. Uh, so, it's actually funny. That is a great quote, but I mean, it's a very meaningful quote, but Einstein didn't actually say exactly that. If you, if you go back to the German, he was specifically talking about mathematics. And he's, what he was saying is, you cannot solve a mathematical equation within the same limits of mathematics that the, uh, that the, that the unsolved problem was created in. So uh, that, that quote, in that quote in German was loosely translated from German to English in a spoken conversation in 2002. And in 2002, somebody reflecting upon that in German said it to somebody in English and the somebody in English wrote it down and then put it into a book mistranslated as you cannot solve any problem in the same state of consciousness in which it was created, right? Mm -hmm. And basically the book, in which it was mistranslated is this one which <laughs> that was you that was me <laughs> so i actually mistranslated einstein einstein and it just has just become a meme ever since you know that it just got bounced around and bounced around <laughs> so my my mistranslation became actually a shared meme as a uh, so it's kind of a fun thing i love it that's that's fantastic and it's just as powerful uh you know it applies uh just as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> a way to, uh, I'm thinking of a way to, to, to bring this back, to loop this back to Radical, Radical Brilliance. Brilliance. Yeah, and sure. there is the, um, the, everyone confined at home because of COVID and you being confined uh, after your, your brain injury. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a parallel del there of reflection. Yeah. So for that, perhaps that, that's the, the way that we can sort of come back into your story. Sure. Uh, you know, you developed this, yeah, this model. And and I still would love, because it's such a fantastic working model, would love to talk about that as well. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So I, I can pick it up and we can actually condense it a bit. So as I was saying, I was, you know, in this dark room, 
doing some reverse engineering in my head, what is it that makes these people that we talked about so incredibly fulfilled? And initially I was thinking it was one thing, you know, that there was one pre predeterminant that caused fulfillment. And in a way there is, in a way there is, but it's what causes it that's interesting. So you could say what people have in common who are incredibly fulfilled is to borrow a word from India, they have discovered their dharma, right? And there isn't an exact translation for that word, but it's loosely translated as purpose, like why you're here on the planet, you know? That you somehow recognize, not through figuring it out, but just through sort of relaxing, you realize that you were born to deliver a particular kind of gift. The gift might be just the way that you show up. The gift might be simply your, dis your natural disposition but you were born to deliver a certain kind of gift. And if you give that gift, your life will find its fulfillment. And if the gift remains ungiven, which it tragically mostly does, you will live in desire and fear and frustration, but you'll always have this nagging feeling that you didn't quite live what you came here for, right? And I'll just give you a quick illustration of that. Just, you know, I'll just think of both, just, I'll just, I don't want to go down too far down this road, but just to, to give an example. Um, I'll just give an example of both my uh, godfathers, both my grandfathers, I'm sorry, both my grandfathers. So okay. my mother's father was born in Northern Ireland and he grew up on a kind of an estate, like, you know, it was like, like a, a landowner, somebody who owned a lot of land, you know, okay. and he loved plants. He loved plants. He loved growing things. And he, um, uh, so he, um, sorry a minute. I, I just lost my train of thought. So he, um, he, all, he loved plants. He loved growing things and he wanted to, uh, to open a market garden. That's what, what he really wanted to do was, was grow vegetables, grow, grow fruits and vegetables and sell them in the market. Mm. His father said, that is not a suitable profession for someone of your social status because uh, England and Northern Ireland was very, social, uh, very much about social class. So instead, my grandfather became a stockbroker he was active as a stockbroker in 1928 at the time of the great crash. He had a severe nervous breakdown, never recovered and just lived a kind of wreck of a man after that. He never really, um, never bounced back. Mm. So, that kind of haunted him his whole life. You know, the, 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 the memory of wishing he had been a market gardener mm -hmm. and you could say he never lived his dharma you know he never lived what his heart told him he was there to be there for now my other grandfather my father's father went to oxford university and he played cricket for oxford and you can actually find him on wikipedia osmond arda he played in the team for oxford so that meant i mean to play that at that time in the late 1920s to actually be on the team for the most prestigious university in England meant you had every chance of a career as a professional cricketer, you know, which today you would, that you would make, you know, you'd be earning millions of dollars a year to be a professional athlete like that. But again, he was told that's not a gentleman's profession. He was sent off to the colonial service in Africa where he was basically the colonial service means he was being a colonialist. He was actually, you know, ruling over um, a, uh, a colonized country. And again, he died in his 50s. I never knew him. He died before I was born. But there you can see both my grandfathers, they didn't live their dharma. They lived mm. something they were told to do. And honestly, most people these days, they, they don't end up living the unique gift they were born to live. That's what I do now as a, that's my work. You know, I, I, I that's my that's my work as a coach is I help people to discover 
the big impact they were born to make. And I helped them really, you know, really activate the, the, the machinery necessary to make it happen. So, so now we could say that maybe you could say that is the precondition to real fulfillment is that you discover your dharma and then you are fully on fire. You know, you wake up every morning full of energy, you bounce out of bed, you naturally eat the right foods to be healthy because you've got a dharma to give. You, you, you get enough sleep, you take care of yourself, you have great relationships, money flows in and out because you've got a mission and everything is in service to that mission. However, we've got to ask ourselves, why do some people discover their dharma and others don't? Mm. 